Once again, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Joey, and I will be your host today for hashtag Next Normal webinar series brought to you by International Medical University, IMU, Malaysia's first and most established private medical and health sciences university with 28 years of dedicated focus in healthcare education. Now, today's webinar series brings us to the second episode since our launch a month ago, actually. So this monthly webinar series aim at sharing and providing tips and advice on various topics to help students and young adults like yourself to adjust and adapt to the next normal. Now, um, the CMCO has just returned and uh, it might have caught some of us by surprise, but um, hang in there and I believe everyone is doing their best to help flatten the curve. No matter where you join us from today, we hope you are well and safe. Now, before we begin the webinar proper, let's go over some very simple housekeeping rules, which you might already be very familiar with. Now, number one, we have muted the microphones for all attendees, kind of keep it that way. And for questions and feedback, please use the Q&A panel in your Zoom app. Now, if you look down, um, there's a little um, control panel, right? So there are two uh, windows actually. One is chats and the other one is uh, Q&A. So do post your um, questions on the Q&A and we'll get to them, all right? And of course, this uh, session will be recorded, but only partially. Um, it will stop recording during the q and uh, the live Q&A session, okay? Now, um, without much ado, um, let's get on to today's topic, actually. Now, today we are discussing mindfulness. Every mind matters. Now. To some people, challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic can be very, very challenging, unbearable, and even stressful. But did you notice that for some people, um, they seem to take it a little bit more optimistically uh, with a more positive attitude, and they are able to motivate themselves and stay safe and healthy. Now, have you ever wondered how did they do that and how did they um, bounce right back from the challenges in their lives? So, um, so what we're trying to do today is that um, we want to look closer and look deeper into the idea of mindfulness and self-compassion because research has it that um, they are the two most powerful resources to help us meet inevitable crisis and transform our life experience. Now, today, IMU collaborates with uh, Ms. Lo Mi Yen, one of Malaysia's foremost proponents of the application of psychology and mindfulness for individuals, couples, families, and communities. Now, um, Ms. Mian has, I will be sharing a little bit on the practice of mindfulness and self-compassion in enhancing wellness and resiliency, especially in these new times. Now, um, today's session is gonna be a little bit like a fire chat, uh, fireside chat. So um, we're just gonna take it uh, uh, one step at a time and it's more of like a discussion. So, you know, along the way um, between uh, me and I will explore further um, the idea of mindfulness and also self-compassion. So at any point in time, if you have um, questions, just post it up onto the Q&A and then we'll take it on one, uh, one thing at a time, okay? Now, um, just to give a proper introduction to me and our speaker today, uh, Mian Lo uh, is a clinical psychologist, mindful self-compassion teacher and uh, mindfulness-based uh, therapist. Okay, and she has been um, conducting interventions uh, using uh, mindfulness and also self-compassion to help people managing stress, burnout, and building emotional resilience since 2012. So Mian has professional membership in Malaysian Society of Clinical Psychology and Employee Assistant Professionals Association, EAPA. All right, so now um, Mian, Thank you so much once again uh, for joining us. And, um, you know, in these challenging times, um, we could use a little bit of um, positivity and a word of advice, you know, on how to, um, you know, barricade these external circumstances and thrive within and also maintain um, uh, our sanity and, you know, mm -hmm. and positivity and, and how to go on, right? Okay, so um, now I just want to start with a very... Um, uh, first questions to get us rolling. Now, during this challenging time, what are the most common mental health issues um, faced by students and young adults? 
Well, uh, thank you, Joey. Thank you for your generous introduction. But before that, Joey, uh, do we want to take the slides away so that I can look at you and then at least we can actually dialogue with each other? I'm still seeing the slide, you know, the opening it. slide. Yes, let's take that away. Let's do that. Yes, yeah, that's much more better, Joey. Yeah, okay. And uh, of course, first of all, let me thank uh, IMU for inviting me uh, to share this afternoon. And I believe it's not only the IMU community that we are addressing because we open up this webinar to the public. Yeah, so thank you IMU for doing that. And uh, you know, we are hitting at 40 plus attendees. Yeah, I'm trying to minus, you know, attendees and panelists to get the mathematics correct. But anyway, we have 40 plus of you and uh, I hope, I hope whatever time that we have dedicated this afternoon, I could try my best to give you at least the initial glimpse towards uh, mindfulness and self-compassion practice, Joey. Yeah, because Joey, you know why I say this? Because, uh, you know, mindfulness and self-compassion practice, if we are looking at a structured program, the program that I usually teach is eight weeks Every week is two and a half hours class plus a one day retreat. So that will take us to 28 hours. And today we are doing one hour. <laughs> so it's going to be a power, powerful session. <laughs> Well, well, I, 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 I acknowledge my limitation. So that's why I'm apologizing ahead to the audience that, you know, if you feel that your question is unanswered, we apologize. Yeah. But I think what we will do, uh, you know, I think uh, together with the uh, organizer, uh, we will actually look at your question and answer it even post this webinar. Yeah. So because uh, we know, because audience join us because they have questions to ask. But at the same time, of course, uh, due to the time limitation, we will still answer it uh, accordingly afterward. So, but anyway, I'll take uh, our host question because that's the job of Joey, right? The <laughs> kick off discussion. And uh, your question is, uh, you know, what are the uh, major mental health challenges impacting, uh, of course, your population is mainly young adults and students, but I would say that I will answer it uh, is the same regardless, yeah? because uh, I think what is hitting us right from March till now, yeah, it is definitely a lot of uncertainty, anxiety, worries, fear, yeah, fear, a lot of fear, yeah. And uh, this is in addition to, let's say, you know, your usual IMU student stress, you know, I know medical students, they're very stressed out or, or your other, you know, uh, biosciences, yeah. But on top of that, this year, all of them are challenged with this big piece, yeah, which of course, in every pandemic uh, or crisis, unfortunately, yeah, it is this sense of just not knowing and just bearing with the restlessness, yeah? And even, uh, I think uh, definitely uh, a lot of people has also developed a lot of fear, yeah? Because this round, this pandemic, yeah? Compared to SARS, yeah? Back in 2003 that hit Asia, this uh, pandemic is much more challenging because the infection uh, method, yeah? is much more challenging for us to cope as a community, yeah? I think, uh, Joey, like you see, right? All of us, uh, you know, are now back to CMCO and there are talks about certain parts of Selangor is gonna be EMCO, yeah? So, so looks like, you know, uh, you know, the rest of the weeks or months, not only here in Malaysia, but I think throughout the world, all of us will still have to learn to live with this uh, anxiety, uncertainty, and fear. Yeah. So that's how I will answer your first question, Joey. Okay. Sounds. Yeah. That's it's, it's actually quite a lot to take in. You know, just when everybody thought that you know, like, okay, we are slowly rolling back into business, and then boom, it, it happens again, right? So, um, all right. So now let's get on to um, our, our second uh, discussion. Mm. Have for today is that um, you know common health, uh, common mental health issues observed among students and young mm. adults are of course um, stress, anxiety, like what you mm. mentioned, you know, fear. Now, can you take us through the difference between stress, anxiety, mm. and depression? Because 
many of these words are actually um, being used interchangeably, but yeah. somehow they, they have different connotations and also represent a different state of mind, right? Yes, so now, yes. This uh, stress, anxiety, depression become a disorder and that it has become a little bit more of an emergency that everybody needs to look into. Yeah, and like I say, you know, especially during this pandemic, a lot of these symptoms could be affecting us. And before we know it, we are like, whoa, what hit me, right? So, uh, Joey, at this point, because I've prepared about six slides uh, in anticipation of, uh, you know, uh, things that may crop up due to this topic. Uh, but let me share this slide, Joey, because I think uh, not only I want to talk about, uh, you know, uh, depression, anxiety, and stress, but I would like uh, to also talk about the other side of it, which of course, this is my own term, uh, Joey, H-O-P-E, this is my own term. But uh, let me start with the red color first, since you asked me about the red color, how to differentiate it, right? So I think that's why if you look at my uh, slide, yeah, I put a pyramid, yeah, because at the bottom of the pyramid, it is where in general, that's the big population, right? The bottom of the pyramid is bigger, yeah? So definitely, yeah, all of us are vulnerable towards stress, right? So that's why it's at the bottom of the pyramid. And stress, uh, I think uh, all of us in this audience, yeah, we are not uh, uh, new to it. We are not, uh, you know, we are familiar to it, yeah? Perhaps uh, just very quickly, uh, just to run you through, yeah, there are four areas of stress symptoms that could help us to identify whether our stress level is, uh, you know, getting into us or not. Firstly, is from the thinking uh, aspect. Yeah, thoughts, what I call uh, stress uh, symptom related to thoughts. You know, for me, yeah, the one that is my own signature stress symptom in the area of thoughts is actually forgetfulness. When I cannot remember things, my mind is muddled up. Yeah, I'm, uh, you know, kalang kabot. Yeah, so, to, uh, you know, that's one, uh, you know, clear indication for myself. I'm talking about myself, stress symptom. And of course, you know, there are other areas like emotional area would be, you know, that sense of uh, sadness, restlessness, irritability, anger, you know, I'm, I'm hitting a lot of buttons, right? <laughs> yeah, all of us, uh, you know, do have all this, yeah. So the, I'm just going quickly because it's a long list, yeah? I'm not going to run through, but I think you know where I'm getting at. And the other one is, of course, uh, you know, from the physiological aspect, you know, even, you know, right from all our Zoom meeting, Microsoft team meeting, whatever, our physical tiredness, yeah? And of course, it can even drive into a lot of physical illnesses, yeah? So, the, like, you know, even tummy ache, back ache, neck pain, you know, uh, what do you call it, shoulder uh, pain, yeah? A lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, physiological stresses, uh, physiological symptoms uh, that would indicate to us that we are stressed out. Behaviorally, is like I say, you know, I think I'm, I, I, I talked together with the forgetfulness just now, the kalang kabut, yeah, that uh, we are, you know, rushing here and there, or we are all uh, numb and isolated, withdrawn. Yeah, so these are the behavioral symptoms. So very quickly, yeah, of course, uh, you know, the lists are much more longer. I'm just very quickly highlight, yeah, in a very general sense, this stress symptom. You all know it, yeah, and all of us actually have it, yeah. So that's, that's the easy way to understand stress. Whereas anxiety and depression, of course, uh, you know, they have all these stress symptoms. But Joey, based on your question, one easy way on how to differentiate is that the anxiety symptoms seems to be more future orientated, worry about the future. Yeah. So I always say that anxiety is inclining towards the future, worry, worry about what has not happened. Whereas depression is more, yeah, the regrets, yeah, the uh, frustration, the anger, or even, the, you know, blame, 
of what has happened in the past. Yeah. So the, this is where, you know, if you find that your mind is always geared towards worrying, worrying, worrying about the future, that's very indicative of a lot of the anxiety-based symptoms. Whereas if your mind is always, uh, you know, inclined or dragged towards, ah, yo, I should have done this. Ah, yeah, I shouldn't have done that. Ah, if only I know I wouldn't have done that. Yeah, so it's always, you know, falling into regretting or blaming the past. So that's very indicative of depression. Yeah. So Joey, I think uh, in a very quick manner, I hope uh, I managed to answer you on how quickly we want to differentiate that. And um, of course, uh, this is where, uh, you know, to me is that uh, when do we get help? The easiest way is that uh, when we feel that even our daily functioning, if we are a student, we are a lecturer, or we are staff in uh, you know whichever workplace that we are in yeah or even we are a housewife mother carer or whatever if you find that yeah if you find that uh, what to call that uh, you know you are struggling and you're not functioning in your usual way for a prolonged time joey yeah because we can be like oh this is an exhausting week yeah okay that can happen to all of us but week after week yeah, if you're talking about three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, six weeks, and you're feeling this, uh, you know, draggy, horrible feeling that I'm not myself, I'm not functioning as I am usually is, or I keep on making mistake, yeah, in my work, uh, you know, in, in as a student or as a working paper or whatever, yeah, then something is wrong, Joey, yeah. yeah. And uh, to me, in fact, you know, that red flag uh, should be, at that point that, hey, I probably need to check out, you know, what's wrong with me. But you know why, Joey? People don't do that. In fact, people drag on for weeks and for months, yeah? And this is unfortunate because like in my work, a lot of times when people come, they're really in very bad shape, yeah? And perhaps maybe I'm a clinical psychologist, yeah? So I do get a lot of referral from psychiatrists that have seen the person that is really totally break down by that point, you know? They could not even function, you know, because they could not no longer, you know, attend their lectures or even go to work. Or if they go to work, they have to like keep on taking emergency leave, yeah? So, uh, you know, they're just breaking down. And uh, by the time they saw psychiatrists and psychiatrists refer to us, you know? It is really bad shit, Joey. Yeah. So so and and I think uh, this is the point. I think we want to take today's webinar right as a chance to all our audience today. And if you see that in yourself, or you see that in your fellow cosmic friends or colleagues at work, you know, based on what I've described, hey. Joey, you're not your usual self, right? Joey, if I come to you and say that to you, uh, please listen to me. Yeah. Okay. So because, you know, we, 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 we ourselves, sometimes we can't see our own symptom when we are too stressed out, mm. you know, and uh, we need the people in our life to help to point out to us. Yeah, so that uh, at least uh, we know that, you know, this is red flag and we need to get help. Yeah. Okay. So, so yeah, that's how I would answer your question. Uh, and uh, I, I don't know, do you have anything to add on from your side, Joey? Yeah, I think, um, well, I, I actually benefit more uh, from your sharing as well. So I think um, just based on the three, uh, you know, the, the mm. three terms that we always use, uh, stress, anxiety, and depression. And I think in a nutshell, you know, stress, like what you said, you know, like we experience it on a daily basis, but mm. you say it, it is not nip at the butt. Yeah. Continue to spiral, you know, into like what you said, you know, sometimes it can get really, really bad. And, um, and I think that is very, very clear. And also, I think you also mentioned about um, checking in with yourself in, and to identify the red flags. And sometimes yeah. don't brush it off too quickly. So yes. Great because that, that was what my next question was going to be. Mm. And, and I'm actually looking at the chat right now. We've got some questions coming in. So mm. um, let me just read it out to you and then you can take it um, one at a time. Now, the right. very first one is actually um, from Anonymous. How do we adapt to the uncertainty? Mm. And that um, I will go to Gary's question. 
uh, and also Lily's question next. Yeah. So okay. uh, very quickly, um, uh, what do you call that? Uh, uh, me and just take us to how do we adapt to the uncertainty? Ah, <laughs> okay. This is where I'm going to pull back my slide. Yeah, because I think what I have, I've shown you just now anyway. Yeah, we saw the red color side. You know, we haven't seen the the black color side, which is of course the positive side. But I think that will answer that question about how to manage the uncertainty. So that that's that's why we want to talk about the mindfulness topic today, Joey. Right? Because of course, before we go into the mindfulness topic, this is where I put it in a simple. Uh, you know, uh, term so that all, everybody can remember. Yeah, that's how I usually teach anyway my students. Yeah, so I purposely put uh, you know a word that everybody remember. Hope we need hope during time of uncertainty, right? But hope represent H stand for heal, and that's where we're gonna talk about compassion and self compassion afterwards. I hope I can get the time to share that, and then O refer to open. Yeah, openness or flexible or agile. And uh, you know, Joey, the practice of compassion will actually help us to be more flexible and agile. So I will talk about that when we talk about compassion afterwards. Yeah. So H O. Yeah. The P, I purposely put peace. And I think this is the 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 thing that all of us want, Joey, right? We want peacefulness, calmness, groundedness, yeah in the midst of the frantic chaos situation that we are in in this COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, mindfulness practice, it is well known to actually cultivate the mind or train the mind to be calm and grounded. Yeah. So that's therefore, we are talking about the mindfulness topic today. And E, I put enough. Yeah, and I refer that to the process of acceptance. And mindfulness practice, yeah, combined with compassion practice, it is actually uh, helping us to cultivate these skills of acceptance. Yeah, or the uh, word that people always say is letting go, letting go. Yeah, it sounds easy, but the stages of acceptance, uh, it is actually uh, a skills that we need to learn, but not many of us will get to learn it. You know, school never teach us, university never teach us, but mindfulness practice actually teaches uh, uh, this area of acceptance apart from calming and grounding. Yeah. So I hope, I hope H O P E will be something that our audience can take away. Yeah. Reminding themselves about healing themselves. Yeah. Training themselves to be open, flexible, and agile. You know, practice mindfulness so that they have this calmness and groundedness and uh, learn the skills uh, to actually uh, accept. Uh, or what I call letting go skill, yeah? So, Joey, I, I think uh, this is uh, probably quite clear to answer that question about how to hunt, handle uncertainty, right? I hope the H-O-P-E in a very simple way, yeah? Because I'm not doing a training today, yeah? This is just a one-hour webinar, but I hope as a takeaway, yeah, uh, this can be helpful, yeah, for us to manage uncertainty. Okay, all right. Now, um, I also see a couple of questions that uh, mm. we have already answered earlier, like Gary, uh, we talked about, uh, I mean, Gary's questions was, uh, what's the difference between anxiety and stress? Mm. Um, is it the anxiety future stand of stress? So we, we talked about yeah. stress yeah. that happens every day. And then anxiety is about yeah. worrying the future. Yeah. And then when all this, you know, snowball, it becomes depression, right? Yeah where people live with regrets and stuff. So Gary, I hope um, we managed to answer your question. Now, um, we will probably take a uh, break on taking the questions for now. So we'll just go on uh, with our, our sharing. And then um, if we can't uh, take the questions right now, uh, rest assured that you know, like we'll have them answered after, okay? Now, um, going on to um, our, my next question is that, although discussion surrounding mental health is now more widely discussed, mm -hmm. but some groups of people still find it difficult to open up how would you advise this group of people? Uh, well, I, I hope those of us who are attending today, so I think it shows that we are very open. We came for this webinar to listen and to learn. So hopefully, you know, what you learn, you'll be able to support or influence your family members, friends or colleagues 
who still may not uh, understand fully about mental health. That's why they, 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 they are not uh, very open in talking about it or seeking help. So I always say that, you know, those of us uh, that are able to support and help, we start first, yeah? Because uh, let's say, you know, Joey, let's say you and I are good friends, but if I am open to talk about it, I can probably influence you by first, you know, talking about how I, how I struggle with uh, my own issues and how I have seek help, you know, even as a friend, let's say, who are more, uh, you know, withdrawn and uh, like you say, hesitant to get help. Hopefully, you know, being my friend, you know, long enough, I could uh, model to you. Uh, that, uh, you know, this uh, seeking help, it is okay. That means it is okay not to be okay. So that's why it's important for us to have uh, good people in our life, you know, good friends, good colleagues in our life. So the, the way I'm going to answer you is that, you know, let all of us here, you know, the 67 of us, yeah, be the one to support and influence. If we see anyone that is more withdrawn, shy, not ready to open up, let us be the one to extend our hand, do that, yeah, because, uh, you know, they, they have many, many uh, issues and challenges underneath why they are hesitant to get help, yeah, so, so, and I, I, the best to me is that when they see somebody that they trust, you know, like their friends and family members and close colleague, then they will change their mind, you know, so that's how I'll answer you, Joey, yeah. Okay, great, great. Um, now, uh, moving on to, um, uh, now, if you are as a friend uh, and then you observe someone who finds it difficult to open up, to address a uh, mental health issue, what can we do? Like I said just now, we be the friend to be proactive, to be the one to, to, uh, to, to nudge this friend, you know, because this is, I think, uh, Joey, you know, the other area that all of us struggle with. We always say that, yeah, you know, sensitive topic, lah, you know, how can I talk to Joey about it, you know? But, you know, the, the first step has to come from ourselves. So, therefore, I think this is where, like, personally, I've been doing a lot of public education since March 18. Yeah, I'm very active on Facebook Live and, you know, educating the community, things like that. So, I do my part, yeah? So, and uh, therefore, so I urge everybody, to do the part just like to flatten this curve right of COVID-19 pandemic each of us need to play our role so let us start with us and then hand hold the person that is hesitating we need to do the hand holding and this is where we have to overcome our own uh you know hesitant you know so that's the best way to learn Okay, great. Now, obviously, today's topic is mindfulness and mental health. Now, what? Okay, can we just just define <laughs> these two this, this, this two words? What exactly is mindfulness? Um, before we, uh, I mean, once uh, Mian gets to this question, I mean, I guess with this uh, this this question, then you know we'll be able to have a context as to how to refer to it as the mental health, and then how to cope it with mindfulness. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so this is the core of our topic, right? So, the, you know, so I think Joey, this is where uh, Joey and the rest of the audience bear with me. I have prepared two or three slides, but uh, I would like to take you through so that at least you walk away today from our webinar, having, you know, the uh, understand, uh, uh, to have a, at least a general understanding of uh, mindfulness as a definition and then the benefits, yeah, of course, you must uh, want to know the benefit, right, before you even want to explore whether you want to practice it or not. Let me have my slide so that I can share with you more uh, clearly, yeah, so I'll pull out my slide, yeah. So that is actually my next slide, yeah. So this is the whole system we are looking at. And of course, yeah, on the top of our, this slide is the frantic mind. Yeah, then I have the body and the heart. Yeah, but basically that's how I usually introduce mindfulness. Mindfulness and uh, compassion practice is anchored on this whole chart. Yeah, and of course the main one is because all of us human being, yeah, we have a frantic mind, yeah, and uh, uh, these are the two uh, quick points uh, actually based on research, the 47% of the time that our mind is wandering off, this is by Killingworth and Gilbert, two famous uh, psychologists from Harvard, published uh, 2010, their research, 
to actually indicate to all of us how we suffer. Because at any time that you're doing something, actually 47% of your mind is wandering away. That means uh, it's very hard for us to pay full 100% attention. This is the unfortunate behavior of our mind. That's why we call it the wandering mind. And it's very interesting. The wandering mind is an unhappy mind. Yeah, the two psychologists have found out. Yeah, the wandering mind is the one that makes us unhappy. I think you know because when your mind wander away, it's always wandering to the negative thing, right? I, uh, you know, what if the future or I could have the past? Yeah, the anxiety and depression, the uh, inclination. Yeah. So and therefore, the other piece of uh, their finding is when we train our mind to be able to focus just on something very mundane, you'll be surprised that when the mind are able to focus, yeah, the mind is much more happier. Yeah, this is the whole piece that gel this mindfulness practice because mindfulness practice has always been anchoring on training the mind using the breath, the breath, the flowing breath, yeah, to anchor our mind, yeah. So, and if you look at my chart, yeah, the mind in one place and the body in another. I think it's familiar, right, guys? Yeah, uh, our body is sitting in the lecture hall, but our mind is wandering somewhere else, right? We are not focusing, yeah. So, and of course, this is where, yeah, we can actually have the two most important piece that is free and available to us, which is our breath and our body to help us to train this frantic mind. That's why uh, I put under the body, yeah? Body scan and mindful breathing are two uh, very core exercises in mindfulness uh, training, yeah? So of course, today I can't teach you. It's impossible to do it in this one hour, but I'm just highlighting to you two main exercises. But uh, of course, this is where a lot, a lot of the uh, mindfulness-based exercise, yeah? We are using the breath as an anchor, yeah, as an anchor to intentionally, uh, you know, bring our mind to come back to here and now on whatever we are doing right now, right? To focus back, yeah. So, the, and of course, we can use that, uh, you know, with uh, mindful breathing, which is very powerful, just training the mind to be more focused, yeah? So, so that's what I meant by this. And of course, yeah, this part itself is not sufficient. We need to have the heart practices, and this is where the self-compassion practice will come in, yeah? So there's another piece of research, uh, this one. Uh, I, let me quickly highlight since I put it. The mind behaves like a Velcro when there are negativity. And you guys know what's a Velcro, right? Is that sticky thing? You know, that, uh, okay, let me do this. I have a Velcro. Okay, yeah. <laughs> this is Velcro, right, guys? So the mind, when there are negativity, the negativity tends to be sticking so stickily like a Velcro, and it's so hard for us to actually take away the negativity, you know, yeah? This is how, unfortunately, this is Dr. Rick Hansen's research, yeah? That how human beings, that's why we suffer so much with stress, anxiety, and depression, Joey, right? Because when there are negativity, the mind, our mind, we have like a Velcro, goodness, right? So, you know, that's unfortunate. But then, you know, Joey, when the mind is positive yeah that means when we are having happy things and things like that it doesn't capture it slip away like a non-stick pen <laughs> yeah you see so it's so hard for us to treasure to appreciate to accumulate to savior all our positive experiences because it tends to slip off like a non-stick pen whereas when there's negativity it will stick on like a velcro so therefore, guys, uh, you know, that's where the mindfulness uh, training comes in. Let me just quickly share with you, yeah, because, uh, you know, some of you came to this talk because you're like wondering, what is this mindfulness, you know, and self-compassion. So remember this whole system I talk about, yeah, and we are handling the whole system with the mindfulness and compassion practice. That means handling from training the body, training the mind, training the heart, yeah, and, uh 
Of course, uh, very quickly, let me bring you to the definition of what is mindfulness and what is self-compassion. So the Sifu or the guru yeah, of uh, circular mindfulness uh, intervention is uh, none other than Dr. John Kabat-Zinn. Yeah? Uh, of course, he's, he's retired now, yeah? but uh, he started uh, his uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction program, the eight weeks program, back in the late 70s in the University of Massachusetts Medical School. Yeah, just the IMU, right? That's where it started in a medical school. Yeah, and in the teaching hospital, where you know a lot of his medical colleagues were sent to him, patients that they are at loss on how to counsel the patient anymore because all the medication cannot work. The patient is complaining about their especially pain. Yeah, in pain management, that's where mindfulness started. And John Kabat-Zinn actually successfully through his eight weeks program, mindfulness stress uh, reduction program, actually helped a lot of people through pain management. And fast forward from the 1970s, yeah, we are now in 2020, goodness gracious. Of course, mindfulness has uh, you know, gone into many settings from medical. Of course, the next one, they went into mental health and then they went into education and then the last one is actually workplace. So mindfulness as an intervention now has gone to a lot of area. Yeah? But in Malaysia, it's still relatively a baby. Yeah? So, but anyway, yeah, I can go on and on and talk about John Kabat-Zinn because I've attended his training right, right from the guru himself. He's such a humble, nice teacher. Yeah? So, but this is the definition from John. He says that what is this mindfulness? Mindfulness is actually referring to the awareness that arises in us when we pay attention on purpose in the present moment and non-judgmentally. It's quite a mouthful definition. I'll give you another definition from another teacher of mine, uh, Christopher Germer, which is the uh, co-founder of Self-Compassion School. Uh, Chris uh, actually talk about mindfulness in a more simple way. He refers to mindfulness is awareness that arises yeah, in the present moment with acceptance, which means that in simple term, whatever that we are experiencing right now, that means whatever that we are paying attention to right now or what we are focusing to right now, yeah, we are fully on it, accepting it. We are not, uh, you know, af uh, affected by our biased judgment or affected by our wandering mind, but our mind or our attention is really, really here in the present moment, accepting whatever that is unfolding moment to moment. That's a very sharp focus and attention if you ask me. Right, so the, therefore, actually, mindfulness is used a lot in attention training. That's why it's used a lot in looking at performance and achievement. Yeah, schools and workplace are using it that way, you know. But in a way, yeah, in our medical and mental health, we use it is because of our wandering mind. We want to train the wandering mind to be able to focus on something simple like just our breathing our gentle flow of breathing, you know, so that the mind is not, you know, chaotic, like a monkey running here and there, right? Our mind runs like a monkey, yeah, very chaotic, yeah? So we, like, we would like to use mindfulness exercise to train the mind to calm down, to be grounded, yeah, by, you know, just as simple as focusing on the breath, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's what, uh, you know, the gist of this uh, definition of mindfulness and compassion. Yeah, of course, is the other side of mindfulness. And uh, this definition that I would like to highlight to you today is actually called self-compassion because, uh, you know, compassion uh, in general sometimes, yeah, we are compassionate people, but we forgot to be compassionate to ourselves. But for us to be resilient, 
to be flexible, to be agile, to be accepting, yeah, especially in the midst of uncertainty and a lot of rapid changes, we really need a lot of self-compassion towards our own suffering. So okay. therefore, Dr. Christine Neff uh, defined self-compassion as when we ourselves suffer, caring for ourselves as we would care for someone we truly love. You know why she said that? Because her research have shown, thank goodness, 78% of us in the world, yeah, in her big data, yeah, in her big research, yeah, it's actually many thousands of uh, uh, subjects, yeah, but it is found that 78% of us are actually very compassionate and caring people, but we forgot about ourselves. Therefore, when we ourselves suffer, you know, we do not realize, we do not care for ourselves. We lost ourselves, yeah, in the midst of caring for other people. And that is the ingredient for burnout. I work a lot in this area, yeah, helping people with burnout, yeah, with self compassion practice. Christine Neff came from her own experience being a mother of a highly autistic child, right? So it's her own suffering, uh, you know, through her, you know, uh, mistakes that she has, uh, you know, done as a mother, you know, and later on in the years, she developed the self-compassion practice. And you know why? In her self-compassion practice, she say three simple elements, but it's not simple, uh, guys, because one of it is actually mindfulness. Huh? So Christine Neff also acknowledged the importance of mindfulness practice, yeah, to be compassionate towards yourself. Of course, the other two, she referred to self-kindness, Please be kind to yourself. Take care of yourself. Yeah, self care. Yeah, this is the key buzzword now. Yeah, in this uh, stressful period of pandemic. Yeah, and uh, that's what she meant by self kindness, self care, self love. Yeah, common humanity is an interesting one. According to her, let us remember, we are all human being. We are all common, which means that all of us suffer together. So it is okay not to be okay. Joey, this is exactly right. If each of us are willing to show our own vulnerability, you know, the people who struggle alone in silence, hopefully they will come out and get help and realize that it is okay not to be okay. And I am not alone in my struggle. So the strong point to take away from the common humanity practice is I am not alone. It is okay not to be okay. Since I'm not alone, many people are struggling in a similar way with me. Let me get help. There are resources out there. Yeah. So at this, I will pause my slide, uh, Joey. Yeah. yeah. So, but I'm trying to like squeeze, you know, so that our audience can take away this whole gist of like, why is it like, you know, we are having this webinar, right? To, to emphasize on the importance of mindfulness and self-compassion practice. And I can tell uh, you guys in a very short sentence, the benefit, yeah? When your mind, uh, you're able to train your mind to be calm and grounded, yeah? Then your acceptance of this chaos world will be higher, right? When you are calm and grounded, you are able to see, yeah, we're ha having COVID-19 infection. We have no choice. We need CMCO or EMCO. Yeah, the acceptance will come in. And then we are also kind to ourselves. Yeah, we try to take care of ourselves. When we are tired, we pause. Yeah, then when we are okay, we come back. We care for other people, compassion towards other people. Yeah, so the healing part I talked about just now, you know, the H refer to compassion. So this is, this is exactly what I mean. If we are able to do this, uh, you can imagine, you know, our mind and our heart will be much more flexible and agile in this uncertainty. And we will struggle less. As we struggle less, we will be less stressful, less anxious and less depressed, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, so Joey, I, I hope I, I make that point, yeah, yeah. Uh, on, the, you know, a very quick way, the benefit of practicing mindfulness and self-compassion. I have a slide later on if you guys want to have a look from, you know, a specific area from research, you know, that have already indicated the past 15 to 20 years of research in a specific area, how these two practices can actually build our resiliency. 
Yeah. So, but I pause at this point so that uh, I'm not sure whether we have some burning question from the audience. And, uh, you know, let, let's, let, let, let you do the work, look at the question. Now, um, basically, in a nutshell, uh, we, we, we saw that, you know, like the difference between stress, anxiety, and depression is really in the time that we are living in. And most of the time, we are living in. Um, the future rather than the, 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 the present. So um, that's why one of the uh, uh, mindfulness and about how it relates to mental health is actually ground ourselves in the present. And uh, like you said, so, I mean, we don't have a lot of time to go through the techniques there. But, um, and I feel that, you know, there is, uh, if any, the, the client, uh, the audience can take any way, anything away from this is pres uh, at the, live at the present yes. and Knowledge the external circumstances, and you have to understand that your 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 own self. You have to love yourself first. Don't take the blame, and then after that you, you work towards it. So, uh, in a very simple, I mean, it, there's there's nothing simple about being mindfulness, you know, because I think it's years of practice. Um, this is not to tell you that you know, like this is a blue pill. Take it and you feel okay. But yeah. since we are in the set in the in this short session. Can you just give us some tips on how to start cultivating a mindful living? What is yes. the most fundamental approach um, to cultivate uh, to cultivating a healthy uh, mindfulness habit? And what are some of the practical mindfulness yes. exercises to start off with? Yeah, so the... I want to pull out this slide so that uh, it's a very nice slide. I hope they can also remember. Yeah, I'm a very visual person. So uh, so that's why as a visual speaker, I'm going to ignore all this boring stuff on benefits in the research. I'm just going to look, go to this uh, beautiful slide. This is mindfulness and self-compassion. Yeah, it is connecting our heart and our brain or our mind. Yeah, so the, this is where, you know, uh, I will let you know some simple practices, but I want you to know the, the, the gist or the benefit of practicing mindfulness and self-compassion is, yeah, when we practice mindfulness, it actually offers us stability. And when we practice self-compassion, it offers us adaptability, the flexible and agile I talk about. And mindfulness and self-compassion are practices of good intention, and not good feeling, yeah? So Joey, I want to highlight this, that it is a, they are practices of good intention and not good feeling because it's so important that mindfulness and self-compassion is a daily practice. That means we have the intention, yeah? We practice it because we have this intention to care for ourselves, the self-compassion. We have this good intention that I want to calm and ground my mind. So we practice it because of this. But a lot of people, when they learn some skill, they will run away of uh, taking the skills to solve their problem immediately. That's why in mindfulness and self-compassion, we always have that slide to remind everybody, you know, it's not a practice that, you know, going to eliminate uh, your negative feeling immediately. You know, it's not a practice that you practice because you want to feel good. In fact, sometimes when you practice mindfulness and self-compassion, you actually are not feeling good because you have to go back and address what you suddenly are so aware of that, you know, all your stress symptoms, how to manage it, yeah? And in fact, you know, it, it, it may not be, uh, you know, the, the usual uh, expectation. That, oh, you know, when I sit down and do my mindfulness exercise, I will feel relaxed, calm and happy. Not that way, you know. So in fact, it's a deeper exercise that helps you to be brave, to look at all your stresses and challenges with a calmer mind. Yeah. And then with this compassionate heart, knowing that I struggle I need to get help to overcome this struggle. I need to reach out for help. Yeah. So, so, you know, that's why you have to practice it with that intention very clear in your mind. Yeah. So that let's make it a daily practice. A simple one I would recommend to everybody is what I call mindfulness in daily life. Mindfulness in daily life is using our daily activity. Yeah. 
to remind us to practice because you know uh, Joey like any other skills or intervention uh, remembering to practice is a problem eh? right we cannot remember when to practice so mindfulness we use our daily activity that you have to do like brushing your teeth taking your shower drinking your coffee or tea eating your lunch and dinner or snacks or whatever mindful eating is big huh? mindful eating right so we use that so i'll suggest like for those of you totally new to mindfulness a takeaway from our today's webinar i would like you to just start uh, by picking a daily activity try to like uh, pick one let's say you pick brushing teeth right stick with it for like a week so that you remember don't change too much you will forget that means you know for this coming week every morning when i wake up in the morning when i brush my teeth just for that two minutes when i brush my teeth i will try my best to bring my mind to the whole sensation of the brushing teeth activity the sensation of the toothbrush you know going through my gum my teeth you know lower part upper part front part uh, you know lower part left right and all those things you know this is actually training your mind to focus on the present moment which is brushing teeth a lot of time uh, we brush our teeth uh, our mind is like thinking Ayo, afterwards uh, nine o'clock i have to present uh, to this panel uh. Ayo, they, uh, they, they ask me difficult question uh. you're brushing your teeth uh, but your mind is actually running to your nine o'clock morning meeting yeah but the training of daily mindfulness is so important two three four five minutes but imagine if just every day you're able to train your mind to, to, to be able to learn how to focus on a simple mundane thing like the sensation of brushing teeth or the sensation of drinking and tasting your coffee or tea. A lot of time, uh, we take our breakfast and we are glancing at our phone. Uh, we don't even taste what we are eating or what we are drinking. But can we, just that three to five minutes, train the mind or allow the mind to just focus on one thing, which is this present moment thing. You're drinking coffee or eating sandwich or brushing teeth or when you're showering, you know, the sensation of you putting the soap. Yeah. So use daily activity. What you want need to remember is that once you choose the activity, yeah, focus on the that specific sensation, be it taste, uh, you know, smell, uh, hearing, seeing, use all your senses. Yeah. If you're walking, you can do mindful walking. Just whatever you're looking at in front of the road. Yeah. So you're utilizing your sight. Yeah. So to choose a daily activity, just practice that as an initial light and easy mindfulness practice. And definitely, that is the most essential step towards mindful living. You imagine uh, if you start in the morning with your mindful brushing teeth, mindful breakfast, yeah, you will enter your nine o'clock meeting much more mindful than before, right? Rather than early morning, you know, you already, you know, have your mind crowded with worry, worry, worry about the meeting, right? So uh, mindfulness in daily life. Right, so uh, that's that's uh, I think uh, D one exercise. This is actually one main exercise that we actually highlight at week one of our training, daily mindfulness. Yeah. Okay. So wow, we are almost goodness. It's almost three o'clock. Yeah. So so the, we may overflow, guys. Yeah, the audience. Yeah. So if some of you need to leave, yeah, no problem. But I think I will let Joey scan through any question, two or three question that we yes. could take. Uh, and, uh, you know, since we are recording all the way, I hope whoever to ask the question, oh, Joey, don't say the name. Lah. Yeah, the uh, question okay. from whom no say the name. No yeah, so that we take the question, I answer it, but uh, let people be anonymous so that they feel comfortable. Huh? Okay. Yeah. So now, uh, what we do is, um, I have got some questions in a mix of in the chat room and also in the Q&A. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the questions from the Q&A first. Mm. And for those who have uh, in the chat, if you don't mind, you can just move your questions over. Otherwise, I will have to attend to that later. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, um, so there's one question that came in that says, um, is there any other method 
to practice mindfulness besides sitting or other type of meditation, which we can practice easily, some simple, quick, fun method. Um, I think this one sort of, um, we yeah. have already gone through that just now, you know, just brush the teeth, brush your teeth and then, you know, enjoy the sensation, um, you know, when you're showering and stuff like that, right? Yes. Uh, then after that, uh, we have another question that comes in and say, uh, being too futuristic is a symptom anxiety, right? Mm -hmm. It's a symptom of anxiety, right? Like if a person likes to plan their future, is it true? Yes, and over worry about what they have planned. Uh, yes. Okay, so yeah, anxiety. Because I think uh, just a quick recap there. Remember, stress is always about the current, you know, like um, oh, I'm going to be late, I'm going to be this, I'm going to be that. But anxiety is more like, you know, um, in the future, it's like I might lose my job, but it has not happened yet. Um, things that, you know, they are they are in the future, but you are already living it now, right? So I think, um, and then after that, you, you know, these two snowball, it becomes depression, okay? You know, Joey, I always say that uh, stress, anxiety, and depression they are actually like uh, brothers and sisters. They are holding hand. So, you know, so it, it sometimes, you know, like I said, it snowball. Yeah, that's why people always say it's about important of managing stress. If not, you may actually, you know, snowball into anxiety or even anxiety disorder or depression or depressive disorder. Yeah, when we become a disorder, that means you're no longer able to cope with all the symptoms. Yeah, that's where you need to see a psychiatrist or a clinical psychologist. Okay. Now, also, um, there is another question that came in and say, will good food intake, change of profession or living environment complement the practice of mindfulness? Oh, yes, definitely. Yeah, I was on another uh, Facebook Live on Sunday night, you know, and people talk about mindful politics. I told them my my strict opinion is that, you know, to be mindful, you first have to be wise. Wise means do not associate yourself with fools. Yeah, so you want to associate yourself with people who are wise and full of wisdom that will care for us, guide us, yeah. So <laughs> definitely, yeah, uh, we need to, you know, one of the thing is actually, again, out of compassion for ourselves, if we are in a very negative or toxic environment, be it the people or the actual nature, nature environment itself, yeah, definitely it's going to be uh, bad for our well-being you know be it physical health or mental health so therefore you know we got to look at ways on how to uh, move away from that you know a lot of people ask me i say that you know uh, this is something a tough decision sometimes you have to change job if that you know uh, that work or that company or that office or that department is so negative and causing you to break down and burn out yeah you got to do something about it hmm. Okay, great. Now, so our next question is, how do we practice mindfulness and self-compassion on a daily basis? And actually, this one is, um, uh, I would like to combine it with the other one. Mm -hmm. um, how would we know? Yeah, so, yeah, how do we practice mindfulness mm -hmm. and self-compassion on a daily basis? Yeah, uh, start start with your mindfulness in daily life using your daily life activity that I suggested just now. Yeah, of course, mindful breathing is more of the sitting down exercise. Today, I will not have time to demonstrate because I need uh, about five to 10 minutes to do that. I can't do that. Yeah, so the, you know, you, you can the, actually combine the exercise. Self-compassion to have their own exercise. The most simple one I'm going to let you take away is that whenever you feel restless, irritable, and you know, like, you know, I'm feeling yucky. Yeah, self-compassion practice starts with when you notice that you know, in your heart, or you can even use your hand as a soothing touch to just like <sighs> soothe yourself. Yeah, you, you can't see me. I'm actually rubbing my, my chest because uh, mommy and daddy in this uh, webinar, you know, when your child is crying or feeling uncomfortable, you know, we use our soothing touch to soothe our child. Yeah, either at the, at the chest, heart area or here. Right, we sue our child. Don't cry, baby. Don't cry. Mommy love you. Right? 
soothing touch is actually from research is found to be a very powerful way to give ourselves compassion. So actually soothing touch is one of the exercises, not only this area, there are different areas yeah, that we can actually practice on. Again, I cannot show you, I got no time, but use okay. soothing touch. Soothing touch, as simple as the one in the heart. You know, yeah, reminding yourself. Remember, Christian Neff say, common humanity, I'm not alone. I can get help. I'm not alone. I can get help. Yeah, it is okay. I'm not feeling okay right now. You're actually giving yourself self-compassion. Mm. Yeah. So, and of course, that is a, in a more proper exercise. We call it self-compassion break. And Joey, at this point, uh, let me... Um, you know, point out to a lot of audience today, since that a lot of question is asking me how to practice it. Let me just do this, yeah, bear with me. Uh, I want to invite, yeah, any one of you, if you're keen, yeah, please join me on Tuesdays, the second and fourth Tuesday of the month. I used to do it weekly, but now I'm down to every uh, two weeks, second and fourth week of the month, where I actually uh, go on Facebook Live and I actually teach mindfulness and self-compassion practices live in the session. That means I guide all of us to practice together. And of course, it's also a dialogue session where you can ask me question. Yeah, question about building resiliencies in daily life. So please join me. Join me and you can ask me more questions there and we can do the practices there live. I dedicate 30 minutes for the practices and then the other 30 minutes is more for dialogue and Q&A. So you actually manage to practice 30 minutes in the session. Yeah. So please join me. Go to uh, my this page, My Mindfulness, uh, My Mindful Spa on the Facebook or, uh, you know, click on it or like it or whatever Then uh, you are on. And, uh, you know, you can actually get notification about this Facebook live session. And I did it uh, this July, I started because a lot of my students, participants were requesting where can they practice? When they practice alone, uh, Joey, they do not know, you know, whether they're practicing correctly, they don't have a place to refer to, right? Because like after you hear my webinar, you know, then you're like practicing on your own. So I decided to start that uh, this July, you know, I actually did weekly sessions so that anyone can just, you know, uh, you know, join in and learn the exercise. We practice it on the spot. So I hope, I hope that a lot of you are asking how else do I practice? What mindfulness uh, practices or what self-compassion practices? Join me on this alternate Tuesday. You will learn different, different exercises. I will guide you through we will practice together. That's the best way, you know. Let's do it together. At least every Tuesday, you practice. Sure. Now, I have another question that is uh, from our audience. Uh, I'm not sure if that, uh, I get this correctly. Just bear with me. Uh, being vulnerable in our community is a to uh, is culturally challenged, mm -hmm. as in like the talk of mental health. Um, mm -hmm. How do we become more vulnerable uh, with the people who view vulnerability as a sign of weakness? I'm guessing you are asking um, mm -hmm. you are asking us to open up, but people are seeing mm -hmm. opening up as a weakness. How do you? Yes. Yeah. Why? Why should I do this? Okay. Uh, to answer you, of course, when we want to open up ourselves, when we want to share, we want to ask for help. Yeah, ask for resources. Yeah, please exercise your wisdom. Right. Go to the people that you feel that they are nice people. Trust. Trust trusting people, like especially students, yeah, you may be more inclined to one of your tutor or your lecturer, you know, do that. I'm not asking you to open up to everybody, right? So you still have to be, uh, you know, wise in choosing the good people for you to approach for help, yeah? Because uh, if you just, you know, uh, open up or share your vulnerability randomly, of course, you know, some people are really... Uh, I don't like to use the word, really not nice and cruel people, you know, people who look down at people, belittling you know, people who, and think that people are weak, you know, when people are open to share about their emotion, please avoid those people, yeah? So when I suggest that you open up, because opening up is very healthy, yeah? Uh, as uh, for us to manage this stress, anxiety, and depression, but you also need to pick, 
yeah, the person that you're opening up to, even among your friends. Some of your friends are very caring and compassionate listener. Those are the ones that you want to talk to. Those are the those that don't care, you know, egoistic, very proud. No need to talk to them. No need to talk to them. Yeah. I guess you know we um, don't make it as an excuse for not yeah. opening up. Just yeah. gotta be more selective. Okay, so I think due to time constraint, we will go on as well. Um, oh, there's this. This is a really uh, cute question. Um, is telling ourselves before we go to bed that we forgive ourselves and I love you considered a self compassion? Oh yes. Yeah, in fact, going before going to bed, I always encourage the self-compassion practice and gratitude practice. Yeah. First is of course, yeah, if I've done anything wrong today, you know, either knowingly or unknowingly, where I would have hurt and caused harm to other people, may I forgive myself. Or if there are people in my life today that have caused me anger irritability you know or, or whatever you know uh, due to their own ignorance either knowingly or unknowingly i also forgive them because all of us are struggling with this uh, velcro mind if you want to put it that way the research shown you know all of us have so much negativity so i forgive myself i forgive others yeah and the other one very important to compliment i am grateful today that uh, Joey bought me a cup of coffee this morning as we entered the office. You know, uh -huh. even grateful for simple things. We don't have to wait for grateful for big incident, you know, big happy incident. No, yeah. But be grateful with our daily simple things, yeah. Like uh, even like I say, you know, sometimes our uh, cosmate or colleague just give us a, a snacks or a sweet, you know, or like coffee, you know, Joey, you treat me coffee this morning, yeah. you know, simple things. You know, or even like, you know, gratitude towards myself. Hey, you know, today was supposed to be a stressful day with so many lectures back to back. But so far, I'm okay as I'm lying in my bed right now. I'm grateful towards myself for my own persistency. Mm. Yeah, gratitude practice and self-compassion practice at night before we go to bed. Best ingredient for a good sleep. Well done. So, and I think uh, to take, uh, to, to sort of put this in context, I think it goes both ways, eh? You yeah. forgive yourself, you also forgive others, and then you love yourself, you also love others. And um, so, yeah, I, 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 and I'm happy to hear this, so I, I, I got to start practicing this. So, now, uh, our next question uh, is uh, on how will we know whether the stress we are facing is based on our overthinking mind? or anxiety, or whether it is an indication that we should move forward and find something else. <laughs> Sorry, I'm laughing aloud <laughs> because uh, definitely overthinking. <laughs> Remember the Velcro. <laughs> yeah, Dr. Rick Hansen talked about it again and again, you know, with so many negative things sticking. <laughs> yeah, so all of us guys, all of us, yeah, we tend to overthink. <laughs> That is one of our, our really, really one of our setback, yeah, that really, you know, can uh, spin us uh, if we are not careful into the S-A-D cycle, yeah, the stress, anxiety, and depression cycle, right? Naturally overthinking. <laughs> Yeah, and I think uh, a lot of us are, I mean, uh, this is a good question, actually, it's a great question. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we just can't draw the line, we just can't. Yes whether this is a serious problem that we need to ponder uh, a bit more seriously or are we really taking it to you know a, a little bit too far so and i think um to 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 look at this is that um if it, if it is not time yet um, yes don't look at it because i think the, the saying is valid when they say you know we'll come to the bridge we will cross it we will come yes. to the bridge, right? yes no matter what you will come to it just don't live it in the in the head and waste it the present moment yes yeah? Correct. Thank you so much for the person who asked this question. And uh, so next one is, um, uh, this is about uh, the lack of clinical psychologists. Training to be mindful mindful is not easy. And Malaysia is lack of clinical psychologists. Do we have a structured self-training plan to train for mindfulness? If there is, it will be very useful for the public. 
Okay, I need to separate that. Actually, in clinical psychology training, there's no training on mindfulness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, totally not. Not in the clinical psychology uh, uh, syllabus at all. When you do your master's in clinical psychology, mindfulness is not in the, in the syllabus at all, or it will be only be introduced as one of the many intervention, right? So, and, uh, you know, thank goodness for this question. Don't only think that clinical psychology program is good because they have all this training. No, yeah please be reminded, yeah, I think this one come from a student, I will seek you to really find out your interest, whether you want to pursue in clinical psychology, counseling psychology, developmental psychology, mm -hmm. educational psychology, yeah, based on that. Mindfulness as an intervention, yeah, it actually takes a lot of vigorous training. I had my hard time, but I was so committed. But, uh, you know, it is because, also because my own background, I'm a practicing Buddhist, so I have been meditating for the last 20 years, yeah? So I know mindfulness space, which is anchored a lot in meditation, is so useful. So I went on my own journey to uh, learn properly. I know how to meditate, doesn't mean that I know how to teach people to meditate, yeah? So I have to, uh, you know, pursue this training, yeah, by going to, to first you know, attend those uh, basic mindfulness uh, training itself, you have to do the basic first. And in fact, you can't do a teacher's training to be a trainer like me now, yeah, immediately after you do your basic training. They require you to practice yourself for two years, yeah? Yeah, because if you, you know, just you know it in your head as a theory, but you don't embody it in your daily life, you cannot be a good teacher. You cannot be trained as a teacher, right? So, uh, you know, those of you who really want to know the training pathway, it's tough. Uh, I started my journey 2014. Yeah, I am now uh, six years down the road. I haven't finished my last part, the mindfulness-based cognitive therapy with Oxford Mindfulness Center because to be a trained teacher, not only we to go for basic teacher's training, after that, we have to conduct live session recorded and to be supervised by the supervisors in Oxford Mindfulness Center. Yeah, it takes time and processes and a lot of money. Oh. That's why I'm also doing it slowly because it's expensive. Yeah, yeah, it's not with our Malaysian currency, it's so expensive to pay for these courses and supervision, right? So it is a long journey. Please, uh, you know, psychologists out there, you cannot be a mindfulness therapist just like that, you know, attend a short course, read a book, you know, read a workbook or a manual and begin to teach your client or patient. Actually, you are not, pra you are not uh, uh, practicing mindfulness. You are just applying the exercises and technique because if you look at it, the eight weeks program is so comprehensive because we cover so many angles of the different practices of the body, the mind, the heart, yeah? So, the, you know, so, so uh, I, I am giving a very tough message, especially to my own psychologist junior. Don't rush the process. You yourself first, please put an effort, dedicate to practice it yourself in your daily life before you even want to think about embarking into, uh, you know, intensive training to train to be a teacher to teach mindfulness. I'm sorry, I'm being tough here. Now I'm putting my teacher's hat. Yeah, I'm putting on my teacher's hat. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for that. And uh, I think we have two very similar questions here also. Uh, one is, uh, will prayer or chanting to God consider a way of practice mindfulness? And mm. also, and then there is another question that comes in and say, does mindfulness involves religion. Okay. So the um, mindfulness practices, circular mindfulness practices doesn't involve religion. Yeah. And this is where all the uh, teachers, you know, uh, all the psychologists teacher, right? John Kabat-Zinn, Christopher Germer, Christine Neff, you know, and so on and so forth. Many more teachers, Rick Hansen and things like that. All of them are psychologists. Yeah. Psychologists who learn meditation first. And then from there, they actually put it into more systematic structure, huh? a module like eight weeks, you know, to train 
uh, anybody who likes to do the training. So therefore, yeah, it is actually non-religious because again, yeah, they have also done vigorous psychological research, pre-post measurement and all those things, yeah, control group, blah, 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 you know. Uh, you know, so it's over the many years, especially John kabat started his journey for so long, goodness gracious, the last 30 years, yeah. So a lot of the intervention now, yeah, there is no connotation of religion at all. Because if you look at it, yeah, a lot of it is anchored on the breath. Breath is totally neutral. It's with us. It's the tool that is within us, right? So, but of course, in all our religious practices, be it, Buddhist, Christian, Muslim, they do have the tradition of meditation. Yeah. So, of course, in each of these uh, religious practices, you know, the Buddhist practice, the Christ Christian practice, or the Muslim practice, yeah, there are meditative practices. Yeah. Uh, so, so, and uh, I would say it's a lot of similarity, like prayers and chanting. You know, where is the similarity? It is how. You actually bring your mind to the present moment. So if you are chanting using your beat, are you focusing on your beat one, beat two, beat three? If you are, the awareness that arises yeah, by paying attention to the present moment, non-judgmentally, you are just counting the beat or you are just chanting or you are just praying you are actually practicing mindfulness. Yeah, so there's no real religious, <laughs> how am I gonna put it? No religious uh, worries if like I say, you know, oh, I'm not a Buddhist, you know, I shouldn't uh, do a mindfulness practice, right? No, so, but because uh, especially all the psychologists have already gone through, you know, using the basic meditative technique and they have actually researched through and presented it in a much more simpler manner. If you ask me, lah, I am a Buddhist and I've been to you know, a meditation retreat 14 days, 21 days, 30 days, yeah, with a you know, very stern meditation teacher, right? Yeah, uh, I would say it's tough. Therefore, all these great psychologists convert it into simple, simple exercise that we can start bit by bit and yet we can build uh, or cultivate our mindfulness and compassion. That's how I'll answer this question. Okay, great. Now, um, we, so are, we are at 320, you know, Joey. Yeah, yes, and we're getting wow. less and less people. So I think we better wrap up. So I don't think we yeah. can answer everybody's question. All right. So I think we, in fact, we have already um, answered all. Actually, yes. Oh, are... great. So we don't have to do the homework, right? Yes. Ah, so um, and I think, uh, do we have time? Okay, I think we have time. Maybe just to one, one, one question here, which is, but I think this one is more of like, a, a, may I know the difference between anxiety attack and panic attack? No, oh, I will skip that. Yeah, so that's, I, I think, yeah. Okay, to this person, we will attend to your questions after. And then, um, yeah, so it has been a fruitful um, session and I hope, uh, that gives people and all our audience a very clear definition of what is mental health and how does mindfulness help us to build resilience and build a stronger mental health and also distinguish between stress, which happens every day, everybody has it. And then if you live in the future, you keep worrying, then that is um, anxiety. And then and you have to start practicing the mindfulness practices that um, um, Ian has suggested, you know, focus on the present and acknowledge them and embrace it and have an exercise self-compassion, self-love to in order to not spiral into depression, okay? And um, and also Mian has also um, told us that, you know, she has got some uh, program coming up uh, next Tuesday and um, feel free to hit her up on uh, Facebook and uh, website. And also, um, also look out for our uh, next uh, webinar that is coming up. So, and I, once again, I would like to thank you, Mian, for your precious time and your um, invaluable guidance. Um, I hope all the audience, um, you guys have benefited from the session. And if you have any um, questions at all, um, you 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 can still drop in um, the the chat. And but we're gonna we're gonna go off. Uh,
right after. But um, if you have um, our details on the, the announcement, so you can always write to us and then uh, we'll see how we can attend to you. All right. Thank you so much. And um, everybody stay safe, keep safe and start exploring, practicing mindfulness. Okay. So thank you so much once again. Thank you, everybody. Welcome and